I think often when history is taught, it is too sanitized. This makes it hard to see historical figures as actual humans. Today, I want to give you a different look at the US presidents, the strange side, the human side, what they were up to, what they were into. It'll be in four convenient categories with the stuff that you already know left out. So get a snack and let's get going. Let us start with the humanness of their bodies, since it influences some things covered later. A number of presidents have had health issues beyond being old men. Some of these are more well known. John F. Kennedy was all messed up. Even as a kid, he had scarlet fever and irritable bowel syndrome. While he was still young, he had osteoporosis and several back surgeries. One of these went so poorly, he was given last rites because he almost died due to a bone infection. He had to wear a back brace for much of his political career, and it has been theorized that this brace kept him upright after the first bullet hit him, which made it easier for the second shot to hit his head. It is also believed that he had Addison's disease. Addison's makes it so your adrenal glands do not produce enough of two hormones. One being cortisol, which is often associated with stress, but it also plays roles in regulating blood pressure, the immune system, blood sugar, and heart function. The other is aldosterone, which balances sodium and potassium in the body. If any of these functions go wrong, you can die. JFK did have medication to treat this at the time, but it was a pretty new field and there was probably a lot of side effects he was dealing with. It's hard to know for sure how it was going because JFK never admitted to having Addison's and in general downplayed his health issues when asked. There is speculation that he may have had another disease similar to Addison's, but we're not for sure. What we are for sure on is he was a very sick man throughout his life, and despite this, he managed to become one of the most important presidents in the history of the United States. Another man that is considered to be one of the greatest presidents was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was also failed by his body. When he was 39, he was paralyzed from the waist down due to an illness. At the time, he was diagnosed with polio, but in the years since, doctors have suggested that he may have had Guillain-Barre syndrome or other nerve-affecting illnesses. It was never a complete secret that he was paralyzed, but the press did agree to not publicize the fact by not photographing him in his wheelchair. Towards the end of World War II, FDR's health began to deteriorate. After going to the Tehran Conference in 1943, he began to have issues with shaking as well as losing weight and low energy. He was diagnosed with high blood pressure and congestive heart failure. His doctor gave him heart medication and told him to limit himself to six cigarettes a day. In 1945, for the first time, he addressed Congress from his wheelchair. Before this, he would use leg braces to stand. The next month, he went to his frequent retreat, Warm Springs, Georgia, where he would soak in the waters to rest. While there, he was sitting for a painting and complained of a headache. His blood pressure had shot up to 300 over 190. That day, he died of a brain hemorrhage. This made him the fourth president to officially die of natural causes in office. The third to die of natural causes in office was Warren Harding, who died in 1923 of heart failure. This one is a bit contentious, though. His wife Florence Harding was viewed suspiciously at the time for refusing to do an autopsy and immediately burning most of his papers. Before him was Zachary Taylor in 1850, who died after eating a lot at a party. There were theories for a long time that he had been poisoned for his stance against slavery, but that was cleared up in 1991. His body was exhumed and analyzed by Oak Ridge National Lab, which found no evidence of poison in his bones. It is believed that he died of plain old gastroenteritis. Probably from the sewage that was in the White House's water supply. At the time, Washington, D.C.'s water system was pretty shitty. And before him, there was William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison's inauguration was a cold and rainy day. Despite this, he gave a two-hour long speech. He also then went for a walk without a coat or hat later in the month and got caught in the rain again. This made him more sewage susceptible. The diagnosis his doctors gave him at the time was pneumonia. But now it is thought that he likely died of typhoid fever and the treatments his doctors gave him. This was the early 1800s, so he was treated with bloodletting, opium, and brandy. Remember everyone, if you're gonna drink poop water, buy a raincoat. A number of presidents are speculated to have had mental issues based on researchers looking through their writings and accounts of people who interacted with them. It's hard to diagnose anyone with a mental disorder without a doctor directly working with them, so take the following theories with a grain of salt. Probably the most concrete instance is that Woodrow Wilson is known to have had multiple strokes during his life, including while he was in office. This includes one in 1919 that left him largely incapacitated for the final years of his presidency. It is believed that his wife Edith was handling a lot of the duties at this time, though there is debate as to how much. A number of other presidents are believed to have dealt with some form of depressive disorder. Most famously, Abraham Lincoln is known to have suffered from bouts of severe depression throughout his life. At the time, his doctors considered him to have melancholy. He was also considered suicidal several times throughout his life, where those around him had to basically put him on suicide watch, where they would take his knives and sit with him to make sure he didn't kill himself. Supposedly, during the Civil War, he would avoid using knives because he was worried that an urge would overcome him, but I'm not sure how valid that statement is or if that's a legend. Theodore Roosevelt, on the other hand, is often thought to have had some form of bipolar disorder based on his behavior. Teddy was described as manic even in his time. He was known for spending money like it was nothing, almost obsessively working to the point that he supposedly wrote 150,000 letters in his life, and his inability to sit still. A diplomat from the time was quoted as saying, You must always remember that the president is about six. Theodore had a habit of running in places where it wasn't quite proper. Another popular theory is that, like me and probably a fair percentage of my audience, 
Thomas Jefferson may have had high-functioning autism. He was often criticized for not making eye contact and dressing too comfortably for occasions, like wearing slippers to cabinet meetings. He also kept a very specific routine, he would take his pet mockingbirds to meetings with him, and he had a myriad of other personality traits that are congruent with being autistic. People also throw mental illnesses at Nixon, like throwing pasta at the wall to see what sticks to try and explain his odd behavior. I think a lot of it was alcohol and we'll get to that later. The recent discussions on Biden's mental declines are also not unprecedented for a president. There are many stories that lend credence to the idea that Ronald Reagan started showing symptoms of Alzheimer's while he was still president. I can't put in the video for copyright reasons, but there is a clip in the additional reading section in the description of Reagan being fed lines by Nancy during an interview by the press. There's a lot of back and forth you can find online about this one, partially due to Reagan's influence on his party. It's a topic I would encourage you to look into more if it interests you. There have been many books, articles, and studies written on this subject. Lastly, due to the power and fame it entails, you could argue that world leaders in general are prone to narcissism. Some more than others. Now on to some sex. Let's get into the juicy stuff. Do you know we had a president with an open marriage? That's not the one I'm talking about, but possible. I'm referring to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, who were also fifth cousins once removed. Eleanor was Teddy's niece. They are both believed to have had a number of lovers during their marriage. FDR's first affair that Eleanor found out about was with Eleanor's secretary, Lucy Mercer, in 1918. It seems from letters we have from them, after this point, it was largely a marriage of convenience. They did seem to care for each other to some extent, though, as she did help a lot with his recovery from the sickness that paralyzed him. Also, Lucy Mercer went on to marry another man, but she was still with FDR when he died at Warm Springs a year after the death of her husband. Eleanor was not there. There are four other women I have seen consistently listed as possible mistresses for FDR. First, Daisy Suckley, who was also with him when he died. She also took a lot of the pictures we have of FDR in his personal life and in his wheelchair. We don't have a lot of insight into the relationship as a lot of their letters were burned. One of the letters we do have has FDR saying, I have longed to have you with me. So take that as you will. He was also linked to Princess Martha of Sweden, who stayed at the White House for much of the war. She was also known to often sail on FDR's yacht with him. FDR's son was quoted as saying, There was no question that Martha was an important figure in father's life during the war. There is a real possibility that a true romantic relationship developed between the president and the princess. There is also his secretary of 20 years, Missy Lehand, who was very close to him, and it is debated if they had a romantic relationship. Missy was his closest advisor in the White House and chief of staff in all but name. She was in basically all meetings, she vetted his mail, and decided whether or not something was important enough to wake him up for during the night. She also spent evenings with him in his study and often sailed with him. FDR's son, Elliot, also said it was normal for her to sit on FDR's lap. Also, Eleanor's biographer described the way she treated Missy as, quote, in the manner of the Asian matriarchs as the junior wife. Missy also received half of the income of FDR's estate in his will. All that said, there is one thing that is often brought up regarding whether or not FDR had actual sexual affairs in the White House. We aren't entirely sure if his penis continued to work when his legs didn't. While all this was happening, Eleanor had her own fun. Eleanor had her own house on the large Roosevelt family estate in Hyde Park, New York. She built it with two women she called life partners named Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman. Both were prominent political activists at the time. They spent much of their time living together in the house, and there's very cute pictures of them. We also have 18 boxes of seemingly romantic letters between Eleanor Roosevelt and a journalist named Lorena Hickok. In one of these letters, Eleanor said, quote, I want to put my arms around you and kiss you at the corner of your mouth. Eleanor also made it clear to multiple people that she never enjoyed sex with FDR and that she had no interest in raising their children. The children were mostly raised by FDR's mother, Sarah. FDR actually never lived separately from his mother until she died in 1941. She was living in the White House with them. At Hyde Park, they even had houses next to each other with a tunnel that joined them. Now we're going to be less FDR heavy going forward. Something else that was open in the White House was Lyndon Johnson's fly. He would often pull out his penis he nicknamed Jumbo while talking to people. I don't know if he actually saw this as a sexual act or if it just stemmed from the strange part of his personality where he seemed to value catching people off guard over a lot of other things. He was also known for having meetings in the bathroom and taking people for rides in his amphicar without telling them it could go in the water. He would then pretend that the brakes had failed and they were going to die by crashing into the Potomac. Okay, let's get to the next president my history nerds are most expecting for the sex section out of the way. James Buchanan was the president before Lincoln and is widely blamed for starting the Civil War. We aren't focusing on that part, but I put an article below if you want to know more. We are focusing on James Buchanan's sexuality. He is also known as the Bachelor President because he is the only president to never marry. There are three theories as to why he never married. The first one is, at one point he was engaged to a woman named Ann Coleman. They had an argument and she broke off the engagement because she thought he was only interested in her because she was from a wealthy family. Shortly after, she overdosed on laudanum which is a mixture of opium and alcohol that was common at the time. It's unknown if it was an accident or on purpose. Her family would not allow him to attend the funeral. Some people think he remained a bachelor because he could not get past this loss. The second theory is that he was gay. 
He lived with a man named William Rufus King for many years and they often attended social functions together. Two men living together and attending functions together was pretty normal at the time. This was partially due to how separated men and women were in society back then. What wasn't as common at the time was the two of them being referred to as Miss Nancy and Aunt Fancy. Supposedly Andrew Jackson started this. We're going to be talking about Mr. Jackson a lot. They stopped living together in 1844 but had plans of eventually running for president and vice president together. That didn't end up happening though. William King was elected as vice president with Franklin Pierce, but King had to take his oath of office in Cuba in 1853, where he was receiving treatment for tuberculosis. He died a little over a month later. We don't have a strong conclusion on the nature of the relationship because it is believed that a lot of their letters to each other were burnt by their nieces. I'm starting to feel left out that I'll never get to burn someone's letters. The third theory is that James Buchanan may have simply been asexual. Maybe the reason Anne felt like he didn't really love her was because he couldn't be attracted to her. And maybe Buchanan and King were just friends. We do have a letter that Buchanan wrote saying that he might marry if he could find a woman that was okay with his quote, lack of ardent or romantic affection. I wouldn't rule out any of the three options from what I read, although I feel like him being straight is probably the least likely. On the other end of things, we have the man we just mentioned, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson had his own strange marriage situation. See, Andrew Jackson fell in love with a woman named Rachel Donaldson while he was boarding at her mother's house. Rachel and Jackson hit it off and began living together. This was upsetting to Rachel's husband. Rachel was still married to a man named Louis Robards. They were separated, but that wasn't really a thing yet. Robards filed for a divorce from Rachel for adultery. Divorce was extremely rare at this point in American history. The divorce between Robards and Rachel was one of just 42 granted by the Virginia State Legislature in a 40-year period. This included a lengthy trial where Rachel was convicted of abandoning her husband. After the divorce was actually final, Jackson and Rachel married for real this time. They went on to have a mostly happy marriage. This was an extremely scandalous story though, and it followed them going forward. Jackson often and dueled people that spoke ill of Rachel. The scandal also became a big issue while he was running for president. Rachel was dragged through the mud by his opponents throughout the campaign. Rachel died of a heart attack shortly before her husband's inauguration. He always blamed the stress from the controversy surrounding their marriage during the election for her heart attack. Despite all this, Jackson and Buchanan actually share something in common. They never fathered a child. The Jacksons did take in a number of children over the years though. This included Andrew Jackson Jr., whose mother was Rachel's sister. Her sister had twins, so she gave one to Andrew and Rachel who raised him as their own son. He also adopted a Native American boy who became known as Lincoya Jackson. Lincoya was a member of the Creek tribe and Jackson found him in the arms of his dead mother who died on Jackson's orders as a general. Lincoya was basically meant to be a pet for Andrew Jackson Jr. He died as a teenager of tuberculosis. Warren Harding was also thought to have no children, but DNA testing has shown that he had a child with his mistress, Nan Britton. In a similar vein, James Madison did not officially father any children of his own, but had a stepchild through his wife, Dolly. There's also evidence that he may have had a child with his half-sister Corrine, who was a slave in his house. Corrine's parents were James Madison's father and one of his slaves. Two more that as far as we know didn't have children were James Polk and George Washington, because they were both sterile. Polk became sterile due to a botched urinary stone surgery. Think about that one. On the other hand, George Washington became sterile due to smallpox, which was not an uncommon occurrence at the time. George had stepchildren though from his wife Martha, who was a widow of a wealthy landowner named Daniel Custis. Martha had four children, but only one lived to adulthood. John Park Custis. John officially had seven children before he died at the age of 26 in 1781. Four of his children lived to adulthood, and George and Martha played a very active role in their lives. A black abolitionist named William Coston is also believed to have been the son of John Park Custis and one of his slaves, Anne Coston. Anne is believed to have been the daughter of Martha Washington's father, John Dandridge. When he died, John Custis passed down a great deal of wealth to his acknowledged descendants due to his biological father's estate. This eventually passed to the great-granddaughter of Martha and George Washington, Mary Anna Custis Lee, and her husband, Robert E. Lee. They inherited a large piece of land near Arlington, Virginia that they would call home till the Civil War. To punish Robert E. Lee, the land was confiscated by the U.S. government and turned into what is now known as Arlington National Cemetery. The last topic for this section is about another founding father, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had plenty of kids. He had six children with his wife, Martha, and possibly six more with his slave, Sally Hemings. It is known for sure Jefferson and Sally Hemings had children together, but we aren't sure how many. We know for sure four lived into adulthood. They were named Beverly, Harriet, Madison, and Eston. Sally Hemings was pretty light-skinned, so her kids with Jefferson were able to pass as white in society. The only reason they got this chance to integrate into white society was because Sally managed to negotiate their freedom. While Sally and Jefferson were in Paris where slavery was not legal, she exchanged her freedom for her children's. Really think about that. She had to negotiate with the father of her children so that they would not be slaves. I can't do justice to the whole story of how Sally Hemings and other enslaved people were treated in America in this video. I will say that as another part of history that is often too sanitized. Slaves were not treated as humans, and as such experienced all the worst things you can imagine happening to a person. I put articles about Sally Hemings as well as a famous case of cruelty against slaves down below if you want to know more.
This is a pretty heavy but important topic, but the rest of the video is a bit more silly. We've already talked about how a number of presidents had health issues. Many of these conditions required medication. Due to his health problems, JFK was known to sometimes get multiple lidocaine injections in his back a day. He was also known to take the painkillers codeine, Demerol, and methadone. He also took multiple drugs for anxiety, as well as Ritalin and barbiturates to go up and down. He also took thyroid hormones and corticosteroids to manage his adrenal issues. FDR is also believed to have taken a host of painkillers and other drugs for his illnesses. We aren't sure what, though, because his medical records disappeared shortly after his death likely burnt. George Washington is believed to have used laudanum to deal with the pain from his famous dental issues. Thomas Jefferson took opium to help with his diarrhea issues. Train Spotting's a great movie if you haven't seen it. Also keep in mind, opium and cocaine were legal and pretty commonly used before the Harrison Narcotics Act in 1914 and the Jones-Miller Act in 1922. They weren't a lot of commonly used medicines, so we wouldn't necessarily have a lot of accounts of presidents using them because it would be like reporting on a modern president taking ibuprofen. There's also a good chance that a lot of presidents born before the 1920s would have probably been given opium-based medicine when they were teething as babies. Possibly the most used drug by presidents has been tobacco. Washington and Jefferson both grew it on their large estates. Ronald Reagan was in cigarette ads when he was an actor, but quit after his brother got cancer. Supposedly, Ulysses S. Grant smoked 20 cigars in one day during the Civil War. He also died of throat cancer. Gerald Ford was a bit of a hipster and smoked eight pipes a day. It seems that most presidents, at least at some point in their lives, were smoking like a choo-choo. From our founding fathers whose fortunes were partially built upon tobacco, to Obama who had to promise Michelle to quit in order to run for president. Donald Trump claims to have never used tobacco, alcohol, or any other drugs. I reached out for clarification, but did not receive a response at the time of recording. There are only a couple other presidents who claim to have not drank alcohol. The other three that I found were Zachary Taylor, Rutherford B. Hayes, and William Taft. The rest range from social drinkers to probable alcoholics. George Washington also owned one of the largest whiskey distilleries in America. One president that definitely drank was Grover Cleveland, who at one point cut back on his drinking to live a healthier life. He cut back to one gallon of beer a day. He was from New Jersey. Also, after having done all this reading on presidents for this video, I've come to a conclusion. I think Grover Cleveland would be the best tasting president in a cannibalistic scenario. Fun fact, the cows that become Wagyu beef are fed beer. On the other hand, Nixon was a lightweight and was drunk often. His alcoholism and its effect on his mental state was even a concern among the White House staff. His Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger, went on record in the years after saying he told the military not to follow orders from the White House unless they were confirmed by him or Henry Kissinger. Kissinger was known to say that if it was up to Nixon, there would have been a nuclear war every week. When Henry Kissinger thinks you're too into bombing, it really says something. You have probably watched or read one of the five million things made about the Lincoln and JFK assassinations, so we are not going to spend much time on those. There is an interesting piece of context about the Lincoln assassination, though, that I feel is often left out. Prior to the assassination, John Wilkes Booth was already famous because he was one of the most popular actors in the country. From the reviews I could find from the time, he apparently had a lot of energy and was considered to be extremely handsome. I never really thought about it before, but he is kind of hunky. His brother Edwin Booth was widely considered to be the best actor of his time. Edwin also founded The Players, which is a social club for actors that is still relevant to this day. His father Junius was also a famous actor. His father also wrote letters to Andrew Jackson threatening to slit his throat. It's nice when a father and son share interests. So think about what the average person's reaction to hearing the news about Lincoln would have been. Oh my god! The president has been shot! Oh, I really liked his assassin in Richard III. The other thing you might not know about Lincoln is that Booth was not the first to take a shot at him. A few months earlier, he was riding his horse, and an unknown gunman shot the hat off his head. They never figured out who, though. There was also the Baltimore plot, which was supposedly a plot to kill him on his way to DC after being elected. There is a pretty good chance that it was made up by Alan Pinkerton, though, to promote his company, the Pinkertons. We're going to talk more about them in videos later if you stick around. There was also an assassination attempt on JFK before the one you know about. In 1960, a 73-year-old Florida man filled his car with dynamite with the intent to blow up JFK while he was on vacation. Him and his family had gone to Palm Beach between the election and the inauguration to relax. The Florida man in question was Richard Pavlik, and his main motive was that he did not like Catholics. The Secret Service caught him, though, thanks to his threats around town and someone alerting them that he had bought dynamite. He also backed out of his first attempt because he did not want to blow up Jackie and the kids, which gave authorities time to find him. Pavlik was committed to a mental hospital. Two other presidents have also been assassinated, and they are not as widely talked about. 
James Garfield was shot to death at a train station by a man named Charles Guiteau in 1881. Charles was a man that never found a place to belong. He was even kicked out of the Oneida community, which was a sex cult commune that went on to make silverware. He eventually contracted neurosyphilis. This is the end stage of how syphilis kills someone. It infects the brain and central nervous system and causes severe brain damage and behavior changes. Charles basically hallucinated that Garfield owed him the position of ambassador to France and took his revenge. Charles was executed. The other president that got got was William McKinley. In 1901, McKinley was assassinated at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York by a man named Leon Zalgas. Leon was an anarchist who wanted to fight wealth inequality. He said that his goal in assassinating McKinley was to change the structure of the government so that the wealthy would no longer take advantage of the poor. Didn't work. Leon was executed, and strangely, the prison officials poured sulfuric acid on him in his coffin to dissolve him. There have been plenty of other assassination attempts as well. Until the 22nd Amendment was ratified in 1947, the two-term limit was a tradition as opposed to a rule. Teddy Roosevelt, having ascended to the presidency due to McKinley's assassination, had some leeway. After completing McKinley's term, he decided he only had one more term left, so he only ran for re-election once afterwards, stepping aside for William Howard Taft to run. After one term of big boy Taft, Teddy changed his mind and ran as a third-party candidate for the Progressive Party, also known as the Bull Moose Party. At one of his campaign stops, a man named John Schrank shot Roosevelt in the chest during a speech. Schrank claimed he did this because McKinley told him to in a dream. He spent the rest of his life in a mental hospital. Do you know what Roosevelt did after he was shot? He finished the speech. The bullet had hit him in his breast pocket where he had his 50-page speech and his metal glasses case. Because of this, the bullet went into him just a little bit, and he wasn't coughing up blood, so he continued. His fifth cousin was also shot at during a speech. FDR was also in Florida between his election and his inauguration. While he was giving a speech in Florida, a man named Giuseppe Zangara fired five shots towards him. None of them hit FDR, but the mayor of Chicago, Anton Cermak, was killed and four in the crowd were injured. There are a lot of questions about this one. Giuseppe was an Italian immigrant, and we don't know a lot about what he was up to before the assassination attempt. We know he served in the Italian army before coming over. We also know that like many people in the Great Depression, he was mad at the wealthy. We know he had chronic health issues. He said one of his main motives was, quote, Since my stomach hurt, I want to make even with the capitalist by killed the president. My stomach hurt long time. That was a direct quote, and all the quotes from him I found were in broken English. I read that many people around the incident weren't sure if he had the mental ability to understand what he did, but I'm also not sure if these questions about his mental state are legitimate, or if people assumed that because he spoke broken English and had an unusual worldview. He made it clear that he hated anarchists, communists, socialists, capitalists, and fascists. He might have liked something, but we didn't really have enough time to find out. The shooting occurred February 15th, 1933, and Giuseppe was executed on March 20th, 1933. Giuseppe's other legacy is that the term death row was created because of him. Florida law didn't allow prisoners awaiting execution to share a cell with anyone. There's already someone waiting to be executed, so they had to designate more cells, becoming a death row instead of a death cell. There are also theories that the mayor of Chicago that died was the intended target and that Giuseppe had been hired by members of organized crime. I also can't find much evidence to support this besides the fact that he was Italian. On the other hand, Gerald Ford had two attempted assassins who were part of groups and were probably not all there. The more famous of the two attempts happened on September 5th, 1975 in Sacramento. A woman named Lynette Fromm, also known as Squeaky, tried to shoot Ford from within arm's reach but forgot to chamber around. Squeaky was a member of the Manson family cult. She has said that her motive was that Ford had talked about loosening air pollution regulations. This meant that she had to kill Gerald Ford to save the Redwoods. She was paroled in 2009. The second attempt on Ford came 17 days later on September 22, 1975 in San Francisco. Shooter number two was also a woman, and her name was Sarah Jane Moore. Moore became interested in the left-wing movements in San Francisco after the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. She began working as a bookkeeper at People in Need, which was created by William Randolph Hearst to make it look like he cared about poor people to try and prevent future relative kidnappings. She was also fired from there, and from the interviews I found of people who worked there, she was probably fired for being annoying. During this time, she met people involved in leftist organizations, and she would inform on them to the FBI. It is believed that she was also involved in the group known as Tribal Thumb, including living with a member shortly before the assassination attempt. Tribal Thumb is its own rabbit hole, and I have an interesting article about them below. Fun fact, Tribal Thumb may have also been informing on other groups to the FBI. The day before she shot at Ford, she had her 44 Magnum and 113 rounds confiscated by the police. They let her go, and the next day, she bought a new gun to shoot the president with. The thing she didn't know is that the new pistol was sighted incorrectly, so she missed. The first shot went wide, then a retired Marine named Oliver Sipple grabbed her arm and tried to stop her. The second shot ricocheted and hit an innocent taxi driver named John Ludwig. He lived! 
Sarah has since said she did it to start a revolution, which is a better excuse than John Hinckley who shot Ronald Reagan to impress Jodie Foster. In 2007, Moore was paroled and she has done several TV interviews since then. I linked a video where a news station had her react to the first Trump assassination attempt. And finally, we will wrap up the violence section with the most violent president. On January 30th, 1835, a man named Richard Lawrence shot at Andrew Jackson with two pistols as he was leaving a funeral at the U.S. Capitol building. Richard did this because he thought that he was Richard III of England and that Jackson was preventing him from accessing his funds. Both pistols misfired and Jackson began mercilessly beating Richard with a cane. Davy Crockett had to step in to keep Jackson from killing Richard. Richard would spend the rest of his life in asylums, although this was the most important day in Richard's life. For Jackson, it was Tuesday. It is believed that Jackson participated in 103 duels in his life, so having a gun pointed at him was not a new experience. It was a new experience for the country, though, because he was the first president to have an assassination attempt. All these weird Andrew Jackson stories are kind of the tip of the iceberg. If you want to know more, there's a great book called American Lion by John Meacham that I recommend. Also, there's a fun song about Andrew Jackson. Well, that's all I have for you. I hope you have a great day and eat something good.